Hello everyone and welcome to my review for Kang and Omega Chapter 142. Before I get into this week's review, I of course have to mention if you haven't already, you should definitely be sure to subscribe and help us reach our subscriber goal for 2022 of hitting 5,000 by the end of the year. Whenever we hit 5,000 subscribers, I'm going to do a 24-hour live stream. That should be a living nightmare and I imagine it'll be very entertaining for all of you watching. So be sure to subscribe so that we can get to that goal. With that out of the way, let's get on with the review. You guys remember those goons that Jia G was saying were going to come to his rescue last week? Do you remember how some people predicted that they were going to get stopped by Hatsumi and Rei, because Hatsumi and Rei need something to do? Uh, and although they're both really strong, neither of them are strong enough to contend with people like Edward or Tiger Nico. Yeah, those people were right, because Hatsumi and Rei are back in this chapter. Uh, we get a little bit of information about how they were training in China. Um, they were, like, training with Wu Jing. Uh, so, it's not clear how much stronger the two of them have gotten since Ashra. Presumably a decent amount. Both of them had the motivation to get stronger. Rei wanted to get strong enough to beat Kuroki. Hatsumi wants to get strong enough to beat Kanao. Neither of those things are ever going to happen. However... The drive to try and achieve them will lead to them trying to get stronger. Um, we don't really get a great showcase of how they may have gotten stronger because they're just dealing with faceless goons. Um, but they're here, uh, and it's confirmed that they've done some kind of training. So we will have to wait and see what's up with them. Uh, needless to say, I'm quite looking forward to it because both of those guys are pretty cool. Uh, and I'm wondering what kind of fights we'll get out of them. Uh, and of course, because Jia Ji's goons are not coming to his rescue, it's just playtime with Joji and Kureishi now. Um, so how do I put this in a colorful way that will not get me demonetized? Um... Jia G is going to be metaphorically getting all of his holes resized by Joji and Kureishi. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's a pretty accurate way to kind of symbolically describe what's about to be happening. We're probably not going to be seeing this on screen, uh, because more exciting things are happening than two top tiers bullying a Chinese twink to death. Um, presumably, though... Tiger Nico is going to show up at some point, because it's kind of a waste of Joji and Kureishi to just have them standing around beating the shit out of Jia G the entire time. Um, so presumably Tiger Nico shows up to quote-unquote rescue Jia G. He may kill him to stop him from, I don't know, leaking information about the worm or something to try and get them to stop beating him up. Uh, and then uh, we'll have these two guys fight Tiger Nico. Maybe Kuroki will join in at some point, because Kuroki's in the building, and he wasn't a member of the tournament, so it's a possibility he could get involved in really any of the conflicts that are going on right now. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, but although Hatsumi and Rei are the title of this chapter, they're not really the main focus. Um, main focus is kind of more so Joji and Kureishi talking to Jia, uh, and then... The stuff going on with Edward. And, um... There's some stuff going on with him. Uh, we finally get his Gui Hun in this chapter. Uh, I've mentioned a couple times in the past that due to the way that Gui Hun makes Westwood Faction members hulk out, it makes them super buff, so buff that they, like, tear through their clothes, and it's kind of dumb... My concern was that Eddie is already buff as shit. Like, he, he is impossibly swole. If Goi Hun works on him the same way it does on the other Westward members, he is going to become spherical. He's going to become a giant fucked up orb that just rolls over everyone, and it's going to be really stupid. So fortunately, Sandrovich did not do that. And instead, in a very interesting turn... Eddie's Goi Hun, which is 100%, of course, looks more like Divine Demon. He's got the, you know, he's got the, the big glowing white veins like everyone else, but his muscles kind of look like phase muscles when he was in Divine Demon. They look like muscle control. 
Um, and I'm wondering, why are they different? Is it because Edward's different? We know that, you know, for Kure, Wu, and Westward members, their Goihun and removal usage is dependent on genetics. I think that's kind of the case for everyone that uses it. Like, people who are not Lu Tien, the reason Lu Tien was able to use removal to any extent was because of his genes. He's not a member of the Kure or Wu clan. Um, he's just lucky enough he's like a 1 in 10 million case for a person outside the clans to be able to use it. People within the clan, their removal rate is dependent on how strong their genetics are. So all of these guys fighting here are like cream of the crop in terms of their uh, genealogy within the clans. Um, but that would also suggest that there's something about their physiology that's different that allows them to reach different levels of removal. And in Eddie's case, his Goi Hun just looks totally different from everyone else's. I'm assuming that has something to do with it. It's probably got something to do with why Edward's so strong. I'm going to assume that Edward is the Ryan of the Westward faction and that he's just this genetic freak who is on a completely different biological level than everyone else. Um... And, oh man, is he on a different level. 100% Gui Hun speed blitzes everyone. He fucking speed blitzes Aerio, Ryan, and Wu Jing in the, like, second it takes for Aerio to fall onto the ground after being struck by Edward. That's a ridiculous speed feat. That's like a Ray-type speed feat. He moves so fast that you can't see him until he's slowed down to hit you. It's fucking nuts. Eddie? Top of the verse tier. Um, in terms of characters with, like, actual on-screen feats, Eddie's probably top of the verse, if we're being really real here. Him, Tiger Nico, probably Katsuya from Fist of the Seeker, um, maybe some other characters. They're top of the verse. Top of the verse... Eddie is probably the strongest character we've seen based on on-screen feats in main series Kengen thus far. I feel like most people are agreeing with this. I don't feel this is a super controversial statement. Is this probably mostly due to recent C-bias and hype? Yes. But also, I mean, Ryan was like top five in Kengen. He was... Still kind of like top five in Omega. Ryan is exceptionally powerful. There are arguments that if Ryan stopped being such a fucking idiot, he could be considered the strongest Kengen fighter in the series. He would have won the Annihilation Tournament if he wasn't a moron. That's a possibility. And Edward was already having no trouble stopping Ario and Ryan while they were both in 100% removal. We know Ryan in 100% removal is just a... An absolute monster. And his ability to stop Ryan in his base form is ridiculous. So when he goes into 100% removal, oh fuck off. There's no one competing with him. There is fucking no one competing with him right now based on on-screen feats. Tiger Nico is probably the only character active in the story right now who really competes with him. Um... I hope I'm not being too hyperbolic here. I like we we know Ryan, Karoki, Oma, Kano, those guys all very strong, but Edward is just on some different shit right now. This guy is endgame stuff. I don't think Eddie's going to be dying anytime soon. I think the idea with Edward is he is supposed to be kind of the endgame goal for Ryan. I think Edward is to Ryan what Tiger Nico is to Oma. I think that's the case. Uh, so this level of power that Edward has is something that Ryan is probably going to be striving for after this. Now, before I get on to the last few parts of today's review, I'd love to give a shout out to my wonderful patron. Special thanks to Neo, Dijon Redden, Anthony Chavez, Honey Mustard, K-God, Chris Redfield, Rat, Ryzen 4K, Artist, Mac Campaign, Wave of Manga, Chuck's Feed and Seed, Jake's Dear Easy, and Play Free Labs. Thank you all very much for supporting me on Patreon. I greatly appreciate it. And if you too want to get a shout out at some point during videos, 
or access to reviews for The Boxer and coming very soon, reviews for One Piece, you can always become a patron as well. There's a link to my Patreon down in the description. Now, after Eddie fucking steamrolls Ryan, Ario, and Wu Jing, he does something very stupid that is purely for the sake of the plot. And that would be him going out of Goi Hun, saying, okay, I'm done here, and then tossing a knife to Solomon so that he can finish them off, okay? That was a very stupid thing to do that exists purely so that the next scene can happen. So Eddie walks off, minding his own business, saying that he's going to go, you know, get them some transportation so they can leave. And then Solomon's head flies past him, because of course it does. Um, now, I've noticed a pattern here. We have a big jobber flag. Okay, do you know what it is? It's when a character has a knife. They pull a knife. Never bring a knife to a fist fight. It's a bitch move. You only do that if you're trying to murder someone. Um, and thus far, characters that bring knives to fist fights tend to get straight up murdered. Just straight up fucking murked. Happened to the worm goons um, when they were trying to kill Koga and Yamashita. Happened to Alan. Soon as Alan pulled that knife out, he got ripped in half. Then Eddie throws this knife to Solomon. Solomon catches it. Next thing you know, he's been fucking decapitated. It's been like two seconds and he gets his head cut off. Um, however, maybe this is all part of Eddie's master plan. Because Eddie's not a moron. Eddie's uh, a, a big muscle guy, but he's not a muscle head. He's got some brains in there. Um, so, who cut Solomon's head off? It was Ario. Ario seems to be in some new version of his removal. It's clearly beyond what he was at before, and he was already at 100% removal. I don't know what the fuck he's doing. I'm really not sure if there's some new level of removal that he's unlocked or something. He looks like an actual fucking demon now. He looks like an actual demon. Um, and this is a really bad sign, because I've seen enough series to know... When the really strong old guy turns into a fucking demon thing so he can fight one of the main villains before the protagonists do, he's gonna die. He's gonna get fucking killed. That's just how it goes. Without fail, every single time. And another sign for this is that now, Ario has the knife. Bad track record. Everyone that pulls out a knife gets fucking killed. Ario's got the knife now, he's gonna die. It was all part of Eddie's plan. He recognized the patterns within the plot, he tested it out with Solomon, and, you know, planned on the knife being taken by Ario. So it's like, aha, Ario, now that you have that knife, you stand no chance against me. You're going to get ripped in half or something, I don't know. He's gonna die. This is probably gonna be the last thing Ario ever does. Uh, and it, you know, seems to be pretty cool. I'm looking forward to see um, seeing how uh, this old man can go out with a bang. And once again, I'm assuming that Eddie's probably gonna be fine. He's probably gonna be okay. Uh, you know, he'll kick the shit out of Ryan again and then leave. Because the idea with the tragedy is that pretty much things only go wrong. Uh, and, you know, Ario dying, the reigning head of the Kure clan for, like, fucking 50 years or something dying... That would probably be considered part of a tragedy. Who knows? Um, anyway, I feel like this worm invasion thing is actually way better than the Hayami coup during the Annihilation Tournament. Because this one has actual fights between the established characters instead of the established characters just kind of dealing with a bunch of nameless fodder guys. Um, so, yeah, I actually like this more than the coup attempt from Ashura. Um, as opposed to where the Annihilation Tournament was uh, way better than the Purgatory Tournament. But, you know, those two tournaments are very different animals. You can't really compare them to each other. You just have to judge them by their own merits and, you know, what the actual tournaments are. In which case, the Annihilation Tournament is still way better. Uh, but, you know, that kind of goes without saying. Anyway... That's pretty much all I've got to say for this week's review. If you enjoyed, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that notification bell so you don't miss any of my uploads. I do Kangen Omega chapter reactions and reviews every week. You should go check out my reaction to this week's chapter if you haven't already. If you enjoyed discussing Kangen Omega with other people, or you just enjoy the content I produce on this channel, I highly suggest you check out my Discord server. I've linked that down in the description. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys around 
Take care.